while you're sitting safe and comfortable in your lounge room, there are others out there who are less fortunate, constantly fearing their lives from a predator that will never stop hunting them down. Some people call them the ultimate assassin or the bloodthirsty killer. And in 2007, they attacked 19 people in this country alone. Still not with me? Well, come with me. My name's Hannah Kass and you're watching EWTV. And today, we're gonna come face to face with 350 kilograms of shark, some even 3.5 meters long. To find out just how safe shark diving really is. Here at Manly Ocean World is where you can overcome your fear of sharks by doing the shark dive or shark feed. The shark feed is 40 minutes, which includes a feeding frenzy without a cage, where the fish, turtles and stingrays will greedily surround you trying to get as much food as they can. But I don't like the idea of being a shark's dinner, so I'm going to take my dive after they've finished eating. But first, there are some safety tips that I need to know. Hi Chris, thanks for having me. No worries, Hannah. Um, well, I'm really excited about my shark dive, but first just a couple of quick questions. Yeah, absolutely. So how safe is this shark dive? Uh, it's a very, very safe dive. Uh, scuba diving is always a lot safer when you're in a confined environment. Here at Ocean World, we're diving inside the aquarium where the water is only three metres deep uh, and there's a big wall around the whole thing, making sure that only the friendly sharks live inside and none of the not so friendly ones can actually get in. Okay, well that sounds promising. And now, apart from a couple of weeks ago, the grey nurse giving a love bite to a British tourist, has anything else happened in the tank? Uh, nothing to do with the animals. That was the first time that one of our customers has uh, been collided with by one of our animals. Uh, in the past, the only people who've been bitten, technically bitten by the sharks, has been staff members because as staff okay. members we have to hand feed the sharks. Uh, we feed them by hand to make sure that all of them get their fair share of food. And in the past, in the 40 years that Ocean World has been here, we've had nine of our staff members accidentally bitten. All right, well, that sounds good. Thank you for your time, Chris, and I'll see you at the dive. You're welcome. All right, guys, what we're gonna do is um, we're gonna do a bit of training with you beforehand. So before, uh, before we actually go diving with the sharks, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the equipment, how to use it, and I'm going to tell you about some basic scuba skills before we go Wow, as well. the suspense is okay, killing so me. I hope I can yeah, remember the everything. Scuba skills that you guys need to know about before we go diving. Um, once you've done these, it's time to go and see the sharks. Right. This is it. Wish me luck.
Good morning and welcome to EWTV. My name is Hannah and today we meet a man who has done some extraordinary things in his life. From meditating in a dark cave by himself to almost falling into an active volcano and everything in between. That's right, today we meet Paul Bailey, author of the new book, Think of an Elephant. Welcome to the show, Paul. Good to be here, Hannah. Perfect. Well, what can't you do? You seem to be able to have done everything. That's what a publicist can do. They can pick out the highlights of a life that's gone on a long time and put them down and make them sound outstanding. But most people have done really interesting things. But you can say, climbed a thousand mountains but are no higher than the first one. So it depends what we learn along the way, I guess. Well, that is interesting. And now let's get into it. In your book, you say, to lead a significant life, we need to break old habits. What kind of negative habits are you talking about and which ones have you overcome? Well, we have habits of mind. Mainly they're the habits we learn off one another we don't even know we're learning. For instance, we've learned to speak English effortlessly. We also learn ways of looking at the world, thinking about the world, and they can be passed down through generations so that in the end we've got a limited hold on reality and we're living a limited life. As I lay out through the book, it's this limited life we've expected of ourselves and we can raise that expectation. Okay, and when do you realise that you have to overcome these bad habits? I guess it's like uh, Anise Neen, a great writer, said that she decided, she realised she had to overcome this when she thought staying contracted in a flower and a little bud was too painful and she needed to bloom. So it's only when we're ready to break out we just decide to move on. Okay, and have you realised that you need to overcome any bad habits? Have you broken out of... Oh, massive bad habits. I don't claim any purity. I, cannot show, I can't guarantee the experience. I can show the pathway and yep. the compass. But all of us have these lessons we need to learn. And in the end, as I lay out in the book, we go past all teachers and we, in fact, find it ourselves. In the end, we're the one we're always sleeping with, always talking to, always having to know better. So we, need, we can get beyond teachers. So there's no sense of guru or better teacher in this. We find yep. our own pathway. So do you have any maybe specific examples that maybe you've... Of what, Hannah? Of, of like a negative habit that you've broken out of, like... Um, well, uh, yeah, I tend to be a, a closet Nazi. I tend to be a little dictator. Okay. And I used to blow up in about a minute, but now I've got it down to about two minutes. Yep. So I'm getting better and better. And in your book, I read that you talk about fear as a negative... Um, oh, that's a serious one, yeah. We yeah. live in fear. Yep. When we're born, we only have two fears, we're told. Uh, loud noises and falling. And as we get on, we learn others. And that's part of this learning process but we can overcome fear, and fear goes with self-absorption. The less self-contracted we are, the less self-focused we are, the less fearful we are. So that heroic things, you see people doing heroic things, that's when they're not thinking of themselves. But in this, we're not talking about being a hero. We're talking about getting beyond this self-contraction, pulling things to ourselves, full of fear, and we just open up a little bit like yeah. a flower. And lastly, to finish up, your book is about encouraging people to be happy and healthier. Do you really think that the people who need this are going to read your book? People who need something uh, often don't go towards it. They need to be shown how to go to what they need. Yep. So it's a mixture of being shown a path and then learning a path. But in the end, it's, it's not for me without disregarding your question, it's not for me to say who needs it. Okay. That would be an arrogant assumption to make. Yep. But we're attracted to where our attention goes. So if you buy a red car, you'll start to see red cars. Yep. If people are interested in this stuff, they will start to think of an elephant and pick up books like that. But we actually go to where our attention is leading us. Always. Yep. Always go to where our attention is leading us. Impossible not to. So is that the same kind of thing as if like, you've heard a song or something and then like you haven't really, um, you've never heard of this song before, but then once you've heard it, it just seems to be everywhere kind of thing, like you just keep hearing it, or like if you see a friend and then you haven't seen them for a while yeah. and then yeah. you let's just think, keep running into them. Like. Yeah, let's think about why that could be. Okay. Either, you're li either you're listening for the song yep. and you weren't before, yep. or you've liked the song because it's just come out, therefore it's going to be more on the airwaves and yep. then therefore you're going to be hearing it more anyhow. Yep. So it may not be a synchronous moment, but your interest in this, see the way your attention is going to find these synchronous moments means you're actually going to find those others that really are this, this capacity we have to take our attention and connection beyond time and space. Yep. We can get out of these dimensions that we need to function in, we have to function yep. in them and go to these other dimensions.
Perfect. Well, thank you, Paul, for talking to us today. Pleasure. This is Paul's new book, Think of an Elephant, and it is in bookstores near you. So I've read it, and I do recommend it, and it's a great read. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Hannah. Thanks. Happy to be here. My name is Hannah and I'm from EWTV. I'm here in Pitt Street Moor and today we're going to be asking what's the most rebellious thing people have ever done. Hey guys, how are you going? I'm from EWTV and I want to know what's the most rebellious thing you guys have ever done. I crashed my dad's car and I said it wasn't me. Oh, that's a sneaky one. Did you get away with it? For about a month. <laughs> <laughs> and then he found out? Yeah, he, he found out where the paint was off on a, on a tree that I hit. <laughs> Probably burnt down my room when I was 16. I didn't get my way, I didn't get to go on summer camp, and I lit a uh, candle burner that accidentally blew up the whole wall. And that was it. That was great. Oh, just a little toy from the shop, and uh, I ran off of it, and I had all these shop people in the shop come in chasing after me. So. Did you get in trouble for it? Uh, not by my parents, no. But by the man that owned, I, I mean, he caught me and I gave it back to him and he gave me a bit of a dressing down in front of a lot of people, which you kind of married embarrassed to him me. For nine <laughs> years, never knew that story. You learn something every day, you learn something every day. Uh, I've been in a stolen car before. A stolen what? Sorry, a car? Yeah. This isn't going to be on TV, is it? Most rebellious thing, probably lighting a cricket pitch on fire. <laughs> wow, that is quite rebellious. How did that come about? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just, just something fun to do? Yeah, we just started lighting it and we're just sitting on the ground and chilling out and someone started lighting it and then all of a sudden it was just on fire. <laughs> Skydiving? Uh, got divorced, I suppose. Got married last week. <laughs> really? Congratulations. Well. Thanks. Anything else rebellious at school or anything? Uh, just the general mutching from school and that kind of Skyping thing. Skyping yeah. Just. What, sorry, what was that? Nothing I'll admit to on camera, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Well, have a good day, guys. Cheers. As you can see, the people of Sydney are rebellious people. And for the most rebellious thing I've ever done, stay tuned.